Hey, this video is all about natural light, the most powerful tool that travel and documentary photographers have. I'm gonna show you how to use it to create powerful photos under any lighting conditions outdoors. Uh, yes, it is possible and I don't wanna talk things up too much, but for some of you, this video will be a bit of a game changer. Hey, I'm Mitchell. For the past decade, I've been living my dream, journeying around the world as a professional travel photographer. During this time, I've seen and I've learned a lot. And now I wanna share the knowledge with you. Come along on the journey. This video is somewhat long. That's because I've packed it with practical tips and examples. In the latter part, there is a guide to natural light and I've even included a PDF version of it for you to download. The link is on the screen now and it's in the description below as well. Very important. Please watch this with a mindset that you can ask me anything in the comments. I mean, that is the beautiful thing about YouTube. Uh, I can present my ideas, I can share my knowledge with you, and then we can all have a nice conversation about it afterwards. Question, have you heard that shooting under the harsh bright light around the midday hours is like a big no-no? I'm sure you've heard numerous times that sunrises, sunsets, the golden hour, this is the best light to shoot in. Maybe I'm slow, but it took me ages to realize that this idea of good light, bad light, it's incredibly simplistic and limiting. It is very common, very widely spread, but it will limit your growth as a travel and documentary photographer. You really have to ask, good or bad in relation to what? Yes, almost everything looks more beautiful under the golden hour light. All the colors look vivid and lively. There's a positive kind of vibe. I do love shooting in this light. It's great for making photos that are very attractive and pleasing to the eye. But photography is so much more than that. Photos can tell stories and convey mood. The feel of what it was like to be present at the moment you pressed the shutter button. Photos don't need to be beautiful to be powerful. Let me show you a series of photos. This photo here, it's not beautiful. However, there's a certain mood and a sense of story the unforgiving environment of the desert. We see it and we can feel it to the extent that a photo allows. The Sahara in Mauritania is a tough place to live in, but I spent some time with nomads who do live there and I photographed them. That unforgiving environment, heat, hardship, this is their world. If this is what I wanna emphasize in my photos, I don't need to wait for sunrises or sunsets and for everything to look vivid and beautiful. The supposedly best light, the golden hour light, is actually not best at all for my purpose. What is the best light here? Well, the one that's considered bad. So rather than avoid the midday hours, I made a very conscious effort to shoot at this time under the harsh light. Why? Because of the way this light makes everything look. It's easier to associate with hardship and hard living conditions. If I made these photos under other lighting conditions, they'd have a totally different impact. Two very important takeaways here. There is no good or bad light. For travel photographers, documentary photographers, it's much more useful to see natural light as a tool. A tool that helps us communicate visually. Just as there are certain tools that are ideal for particular tasks, there are certain types of natural light that are ideal for communicating particular things. Notice what I said there, types of natural light. Natural light can be this fluid, singular, abstract concept, or we can approach it in a more practical way. Personally, I like to mentally organize it into different types or kinds, and this makes it so much more manageable, so much easier to wrap your mind around it. I'll talk about this very practical idea of types of natural light in the guide that's coming up in just a few minutes. Very quick interjection. If you're enjoying this video so far, if you want to create the sorts of photos that convey a sense of mood, that tell stories that are more than just snapshots, you may wanna check out my video course. It's called Behind the Scenes Travel Photographer of the Year Winning Portfolio. Yes, a very long title, but the course is packed with information. Uh, a decade of my knowledge kind of compressed into it. It's the closest thing to a blueprint to creating award-worthy photographs. What happens if you've got the wrong tool, the wrong light for your purpose? Quick story. I was working on a personal photo project 
in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia. As you can see, much of it is just stunning. But my project wasn't only about beautiful nature. I was born and I grew up in the USSR in a pretty gloomy neighborhood, very similar to what you're seeing now. I have dark and somber associations with the Soviet times. It's a past that the entire region shares and I wanted to communicate that through my images. I heard about this industrial town with still functioning old Soviet factories. Sounded like it'd be the sort of place that is depressing, soul killing even. Not everyone's cup of tea, understandably, but perfect for what I needed. This kind of setting would be the perfect representation of the dark and the somber. So I had a clear purpose, but this is what I got in town. Somber, dark, depressing. Those are not the feelings that hit me when I look at the footage or the photos. The potential was definitely there. Huge, ghastly, smoke belching factories. However, the light did something. The smoke, it looks epic, even strangely beautiful. This is the first impression that I have. That's what hits me. The somber, dark mood, it gets lost. Are these photos and videos bad? Well, not necessarily, but I failed to communicate what I wanted. It's like I had the wrong tool, the wrong light for my purpose, even if that light was beautiful. I knew that the light didn't help me with my purpose, but I kept shooting and experimenting. I'll tell you more about experimenting with natural light, why I do it, when I do it, and that'll be in the latter part of the video towards the end. Of course, natural light is not an actual tool. You can't say, pass me the golden light or the diffuse light or anything of that sort. So what happens if you want to communicate something, but the conditions aren't letting you? Another quick story from another former Soviet Republic, Belarus. That's where I was born, and years later learned a very important photographic lesson. I visit Belarus during summers every other year. The weather is usually miserable. Rain, clouds, gray, miserable. This used to frustrate me a lot. I wanted to show the beautiful places that I knew and I wanted to emphasize that beauty. Vivid, lively colors, everything bright, warm, sort of inspirational looking, like what you're seeing. This is from one of the very rare days when I had clear skies and actually saw the sun set. So frustrated, I wasn't shooting much. Then I finally decided the hell with it, I'm just gonna shoot what's there. Those beautiful images, the landscapes, I'll photograph them when or if I get lucky with the weather. I'll shift my focus to document life as it is. Unlike the golden light or the harsh light, these lighting conditions don't beautify anything and they don't emphasize anything. So I looked for situations which didn't need to be enhanced by light. I shot scenes that were beautiful regardless of light. Scenes that were interesting compositionally. I shot stuff happening. Soon the weather became part of my photos. Strong presence of clouds. The subjects looking at dark skies in expectation of rain. Puddles. Raindrops on a window. Or rain. Of course you can go indoors to shoot and sometimes I did, but we're sticking to natural light outdoors in this video. Natural light indoors is a whole different topic with a lot of different nuances and it needs a whole video to itself. So, these photos are shot. They convey the mood, the atmosphere, the wetness, the coolness, and there is a lot of value in that. This is all particularly great when you consider that I was gonna end up with almost nothing if I stuck to the idea of only making beautiful photos. So what changed? Not the weather, not the light. The change was in my mind, in my outlook on things. I adapted. Adapting is actually the only way that you can work with natural light. If you're frustrated, disappointed, maybe even angry, makes no difference at all to the weather or the nature. So you may as well make the most of what you have and get creative with it. As I mentioned, I mentally organize natural light into different types or kinds. You've already been seeing that different kinds of natural light have different characteristics they impact what they illuminate in different ways. This affects how we see, what we feel, and the meaning we attach to particular photos. So next up is a quick guide to natural light. Consider it food for thought, creative ammo, 
or a push to go get out and start making travel photos regardless of the lighting conditions outdoors. The golden hour light. As you've already seen, sunrises, sunsets, the golden hour light is great for making almost anything look beautiful, even an ugly Soviet industrial area. The colors are vivid and there's that nice golden tint. But this light is also very flexible. I mean that in relation to creating a sense of mood. On the one hand, it's perfect for creating a sense of warmth, happiness, just a general positive feel. On the other hand, the interplay of shadow and light can be great for creating a sense of drama. Silhouettes. This light is of course great for those too. Silhouettes give your images a totally different feel. A certain minimalist graphic appeal. Harsh light around the midday hours. As we've learned, this light works particularly well in certain cases, like showing hardship in a desert. The harsh light is great when you want to show the real, the raw, gritty and unfiltered reality. It's the opposite of glamorous. Depending on where you are in relation to the sun, textures can look really prominent under this light. Wrinkles and any skin imperfections can become very visible. Sometimes that's exactly what you want, other times, no. It's not that the harsh light around midday will automatically make everything look unattractive. Beautiful subjects, scenes of nature, they'll still look beautiful, but with a bit of a rugged edge. Important to keep in mind when choosing what to photograph. This light is not one that's going to make everything look dreamy and romantic, like the golden hour light. Light on overcast days. Talked about this light and my images from Belarus. As you saw, under such lighting conditions, I like to make the weather part of my photos, almost like it's a character. On its own, this light creates very little emotional impact. It's neutral, it's flat. Under dark skies, it can cast a grayish tint, but often it doesn't cast any tint on the colors. And the tint plays a big role in setting the mood. These flat and neutral qualities, they can be good in some situations. Let's say that detail is important to what you want to communicate. Here, for example, the story is in the details. No shadows, no tint, no distractions. The photo doesn't hit me on an emotional level, but I'm definitely drawn in by a clear sense of story. Other things I'd suggest shooting in this light. Subjects that are interesting in themselves. Characters some sort of action happening, or sometimes you might want to convey sadness or melancholy. Twilight. Sometimes it's also referred to as the blue hour because it can cast a blue tint. In reality, it can cast different types of tint depending on the color of the sky. And of course, depending on various conditions, which change. We know that during twilight, the sky can be very dramatic. Often when I think twilight, the next thing I think is, how's the sky gonna look? Sometimes it can be awe-inspiring. And no matter what you're shooting, the image will be about that light and color show in the sky before anything else. And when the sky is darker and bluish, I'd say it's easier to associate this light with a sense of mystery, mystique. To me, the darker stages of twilight, that's when you can create poetic kinds of photographs. Maybe it's just a personal feel, but the way twilight can minimalize details, the strong tint, these can make the images very evocative and suggestive rather than literal, kinda like poetry. Lighting conditions in the fog. These are some of my favorites. Very atmospheric, strong sense of mood. Again, a quick mention, one of my winning photos in the behind the scenes travel photography course was taken in the fog. So in the course, I give special attention to light on foggy days. When the fog is thick, the light is very soft. Everything is neutral or gray, similar to overcast days. The difference, when you get further away from your subject in the fog, you lose detail. This isn't a negative though. I see it as an amazing creative opportunity. You can make evocative minimalist images. As with twilight, perhaps somewhat poetic, suggestive rather than literal. You can also position yourself to make distracting elements fade into the background. 
To take advantage of light on foggy days, it really helps to make the fog a feature of the photo. Often in my travel photos, the fog is as much of a subject as a person might be. And then there's light on foggy days when the sun comes out. When the rays of the morning sun illuminate the fog clouds, things can look really magical. You almost feel compelled to shoot something, anything. And this brings me to another way of approaching natural light. Natural light as the driving force behind the photo. Sometimes the lighting scenario is so striking that the light is like a character in its own right. You wanna pick up the camera and shoot virtually anything. As for me, the fog is almost always like that. Also, I love when light interacts with elements like smoke, water, dust. You can just get very evocative, potentially powerful images out of situations like that. If a certain lighting situation inspires you creatively, have fun with it. Doesn't even matter what you shoot, go and experiment. Remember I said earlier that I would talk more about experimenting with natural light? Well, experimenting won't necessarily lead to any worthwhile photographs, or you may end up with something that's kind of cool but doesn't really work. In my case with those smoking factories again. But also when all things come together, and sometimes they do, you are giving yourself a chance to create some of those really memorable, those really special photographs. You might ask, well, how do I now use all this info in practical terms? This information I've given you, it's like my creative ammo, my idea bank. Whenever I'm out working on my projects, I assess the lighting situation, and then I just take ideas from this idea bank. The ideas that are appropriate for the lighting situation that I'm in, I'll put all my energy into those, and I'll put less energy or no energy at all into those ideas that are less likely to work. I know that I haven't mentioned everything in this video, and honestly, uh, there are so many things, so many nuances to talk about that it could go for hours and hours. However, I think that the information that I have given you should give you more confidence. It's enough to help you get out and to start getting creative under different lighting conditions outdoors. If you have questions, if you agree or disagree with something that I said in the video, if you have your own interesting approach to working with natural light, or maybe you just wanna say thank you, let me know in the comments. I would really like to hear from you. And the last couple of things. If you feel that you've gained value from this video, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe. Uh, if you like what I do, if there is a demand from you, then there will be more content like this from me. Thank you very much for watching.